Welcome to episode 71 of the World Builders Anvil. And as always, I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. And today's topic is Discworld and the brilliance of Terry Pratchett. Don't know where to start building your fantasy world? Do you need more? Does it make sense? Forget any worries and become a crafter of imagination. This is the place that will help prime your mind. Now, it's time to heat up the forge, break out the mithril ingots and hammer. Welcome to the World Builders Anvil. I'm your host, Jeffrey W. Ingram. Let's sup from the mug of Java and build. Okay, first off, I'd like to give a very special thanks to lspace.org. They helped me pull together some things that I wanted to talk about about Discworld. It is a great resource for Discworld and Terry Pratchett in general. It says it's about Discworld, but there's really more there than just Discworld. Because Terry Pratchett was bigger than Discworld even though that's, I believe, hit the biggest series he did. Uh, definitely that people know, but largest volume of work as well. So if you go to the show notes page on Gardubel.com, you will see a link to their wiki at lspace.org. And now, let's get started. First off, Discworld. What are some basic things to think about for it? One the world is flat. And that's one of the kind of cool things that people lose track of sometimes when the world building is you do not have to world build based off of the universe of physics that we understand or what we know. It's a perfectly viable option to create this flat world that flows out in space. And it gives a lot of sort of fun things to deal with too. Like one, this is not round world. Round world's a different world. It has different properties and problems than disc world does. You, you need this thing called the uh, circumference, and essentially it's a giant fence built around the edge of the world so ships don't fall off the end. So you go back to all those medieval paintings and see ships pulling off the edge of the world. That will not happen on this world because they built a huge honking fence. And uh, the moon is different too. The moon essentially has a sunny side and a dark side like our moon does. However, it has these really cool plants that lunar dragons eat. When that faces towards you, you have the moon reflecting at you. And when the dark side is, there's no lunar plants. So there are no, there's no light from the moon. And even though you have a very similar sort of calendar structure with about 30 day month, it's just different the way the moon works. And, and this kind of leads into the first sort of level of brilliance for Terry Pratchett is... He thought about things differently than conventional wisdom. I'm not saying that people didn't have these kind of ideas, but he did them. He pulled them off in a humorous manner that really, you know, you know, lets you question the mechanics of the universe. So it lets you sort of stretch the box on what's possible. So if you don't want a naturalistic world, um, you know, based off of science, you don't need one. It's fantasy. And that's the thing to keep in mind is, a lot of times, even people like me sort of push towards a naturalistic style of world because it's, I, I believe, more believable. That doesn't have to be the point of your world. That does not have to be the point of your fantasy. You know, the great thing is you maybe use the differences in the mechanics to sort of question conventional wisdom and thought in our world. There's some brilliant things that you can do and pull off when you have a world of the structure. And... One of the other great things about Terry Pratchett are the monsters and the, the grades of monsters. There's grades one to four. So uh, grade one are uh, basically monsters created by adults to scare children. And these are really pathetic monsters like Ginny Greentooth. And it's the basic low level monster. Uh, grade two, monsters invented by adults to scare anyone, the headless horseman. Who wouldn't want to run into something without a head and throwing fiery stuff at people and killing people on the road? Or at least one poor sap. A grade three monster is a monster by accident. Possibly the most vicious monster in the universe falls in this category, the Eater of Socks. As far as I know, the Eater of Socks strikes every household viciously all of the time. I still have pairs of socks that I can only find one part of. And for me, it's a little bit less noticeable because my socks tend to look more the same. But for my poor wife, 
she has all of these beautiful socks and 25% of them have been eaten by the eater of socks. Now, some might blame me for a sloppy laundry or the cats for attacking the socks and pulling them off. But the fact is, it is a monster called the eater of socks. And we have Terry Pratchett to thank for that. Uh, grade four are monsters who have their own purpose. Uh, in his work, it's the Hiver. Uh, you might think of like, you know, maybe Satan has his own purpose on Earth. But it's typically a sort of more boring category of monsters that we think of where it's like monsters who are monsters because they're monsters. Um, but he has them too in those grades four to five. And with a suggested new grade of the worst kind of monsters according to at least um, the fandom of of Terry Pratchett, which are um, and one Terry Pratchett himself, which are the worst monsters are monsters created by children to scare the pants off of children. And and they think this is the world's worst kind. I'm still stuck with the sock eater being the worst kind. And the example here is the child eating puddle. And as a small boy, like many small boys, my job, part of my job was to stomp into puddles. The thought of a puddle eating children would be scary. But ultimately, in the scope of life, I think the eater of socks is worse. And I think even more funny would be if there's actually pudding that also eats children. Because with the amount of pudding kids put away, at least in this country, they deserve to be eaten by pudding too. Okay. Now, races. You know, there are some interesting races like the uh, Sneeb, things that you don't really see anywhere else. And I don't know, kind of a fairy kind of creature or whatever there with a the beard. I kind of think of guard gnomes when I think of Sneebs, but that might not be true. But the one I found really interesting from Terry Pratchett was his idea of zombies. And the idea that you have a zombie that's the head of the Lawyers Guild. Talk about internal factions from the previous episode. He has a Lawyers Guild and the head of it is a zombie. And the zombies aren't uh, quite as downtrodden as zombies in most modern works of fiction where uh, they're brainless brain-eating things. Because essentially it's either, and I like to think it was laziness on the part of Mr. Reaper. The Grim Reaper was just too lazy to reap all the souls. So maybe it was so busy because of all the killing people do. That might be an excuse Mr. Reaper uses. But uh, Mr. Reaper doesn't get all the souls or... They die before their lifetime runs out. And what an interesting concept that is. It's like, you're still here because we, you know, the universe expected your life to be longer. So you have this life timer and, you know, you're supposed to die when the timer goes off. But if it goes off early, you can stick around as a zombie. Sort of a brilliant take on dead humanoids. Now, the rating for this episode is N.A. There is no rating. Uh, this is just talking about the universe of Terry Pratchett. And once again, it is a couple different breaks from fantasy that you see. One, this idea that his Earth-like fictional world was not Earth-like at all mechanically. And he had a great way of being able to use humor to sort of jab at problems throughout human society. So it's sort of two layers of protection to be able to discuss tough topics. Now, the real world task for the day, create an ironic monster or race for your world. Something that doesn't fit is meant for humor base and you might never use it. And you might think, hey, I do dark fiction or I do, do horror. I don't need to do ironic, practice my sense of humor. You will. And I will tell you why. And that will be in the next episode, which I'll get to in my tease. But... Just do it for Terry, even if you end up throwing it away and not using it. Come up with something ironic, something that doesn't quite fit in the conventional wisdom of humor for fantasy. The real world task for the day. And this is another shout out to the University of Michigan. And this one is to pose a new question to yourself every day. Essentially, you want to expand your mind by having questions that throw you out into different areas you have not explored mentally. Do that. It will help expand your mind. The tease for this episode, <laughs> high drama in a fantasy setting, for, for real, I mean at this time. When I was doing the other one, I didn't realize about the U.S. M Memorial Day holiday. That's the reason why I actually did that episode on Monday, but I plan to talk about this next week. And as always, make sure to go to Garduel.com.
That's G-A-R-D-U-L dot com for the show notes. It'll be under podcasting, World Builders Anvil. That's a great place to get all of the information from the episode that you've just listened to and to see all the resources that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks for joining us this episode of the World Builders Anvil. Please be sure to rate and review us in iTunes and please help get the word out to your friends about our show. And join me, Jeffrey W. Ingram at Garduel.com to see the progress of my world and learn why I made the choices I did. And please contact me and let me know the topics you would love to hear in the future. Now strike, why the myth rolls high.